I see it. Right. Tell them how we yes. better. Well, Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, we come before you now and give you thanks for how you supported John <laughs> through the last few years and how he just allowed the Spirit to work through him. And now, Lord, as he speaks your world, speaks from the scriptures, that you would just allow the Spirit to work through him, and that the Spirit will give him power to preach your gospel. Amen. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Lord, all we have are words, but they, may they be words from you. And we pray, Lord, that you would breathe breath into those words, that they may be words of life, words that transform our lives. We cry, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come today and all who hear these words may be touched and edified by you. Because we ask this in and through your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> it's wonderful to have a number of people that follow regularly on Facebook and YouTube. Um, some of you may know that I'm about to have some treatment for cancer, so I'm not going to be here preaching every Sunday, and the Lord is arranging for various people to come and to speak to you. And uh, one of those people that I'm greatly honoured has offered to help is uh, a former member for a short while, the Reverend John Bellum. All that I've said is very inadequate. I would rather that you go away and buy one of his books. I've only scraped the surface of the Lord's Prayer. And it's so important in our lives to know and to pray the Lord's Prayer. And um, one of his books, Lord Teach Us to Pray, is on the Lord's Prayer. And there's a website, lordsprayer.co.uk, where there's podcasts, where you can hear John reading parts of the book. I found, and I listened, that was very powerful. And I really do want you to be blessed. So it's in a different cover now. <laughs> you'll find the book on Amazon. Look up John Bellum and you'll find what he's written one or two books. But uh, do read the one on the Lord's Prayer because it is absolutely a great read. Well, I've just got one more talk in this series on the Lord's Prayer. And today, I've come to something that's very familiar with all of us. Temptation. <laughs> Has anybody not been tempted? <laughs> I have. It's, it appears twice in the Gospels. Matthew... 6.13 says, And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Luke 11 verse 4 says, Lead us not into temptation. Just a slight difference. Forgiveness is the beginning, not the end. The first step, not the last in the Christian life. In the Gospel according to John, we read the story about a poor woman who was dragged, half dead, with shame into the presence of Christ and charged before him with a na nameless crime. Her enemies crowded round, clamouring for instant punishment. But Jesus... Just because he was so pure and good was instantly tender and pitiful. He had no harsh judgment to pronounce upon this poor, shame-stricken woman. 
when her brutal accusers, made cowards by their own consciences, slunk away, one by one, leaving the sinner alone with her saviour. His word to her was one of pure compassion. Neither do I condemn you. There was pardon for her black sin and forgiveness for her shameful past. But having forgiven her, Christ did not let her go without laying a command upon her. This forgiven woman was not at liberty to return to her old life of folly and shame. Go, said Jesus, dismissing her. Sin no more. That is an illustration of Christ's unvarying methods with sinners. Forgiveness, full, free forgiveness is to be had for the asking. Bring your sinful, shameful past before him so he will hear no bitter, angry words of reproach from his lips. The words you will hear will be words of tenderest compassion. Bring your terrible debt before him and tell him of your dire, your abject, your utter poverty. Say to him, Lord, I have nothing to pay. And he will say to you, all this your debt, I freely forgive you. Bring your burden of guilt and shame to him. He will not spurn you from, from, <coughs> from him, but with words of pity and love, he will welcome you and take the burden of your guilt and shame away. Yes, Christ will freely forgive you. He will have mercy upon you. He will abundantly pardon. But forgiveness of the past is not all. What of the future? Well, as to that future, the Master will lay upon you also the old injunction. Go sin no more. For the forgiven man or woman cannot return to their old life of sin. After forgiveness comes the life of struggle and conflict against the world, the flesh and the devil. After the blotting out of a shameful past comes the earnest striving to keep the record of the future clean. Forgiveness is not the end, but the beginning. After forgiveness comes all that our fathers meant by the old term. It's a difficult word, sanctification. After forgiveness comes all that John means when he tells us to purify ourselves even as he is pure. All that Paul means when he tells us to work out our own salvation. The struggle, the conflict, the battle comes after pardon has been bestowed. For when Jesus whispers in our ears the gladsome message, your sins are forgiven you, he lays upon us also the command, go sin no more. What I've been saying up to this point illustrates the connection between this petition and the one we studied a few Sundays ago, forgive us our debts is a prayer that God will blot out the record of past sin. Lead us not into temptation, 
is a prayer for protection in the future. For I want you to notice that the man who has truly repented of his sins wants not simply the past to be blotted out, but he wants grace to shun sin in the days to come. He wants not only to be delivered from the penalty of sin, but he also longs to be liberated from its power. Let not the freshness of forgiveness ever lead you to think lightly of sin. There are some in the very early days of the church who interpreted this freshness of forgiveness as a license to sin. They said, what does it matter? God will forgive. No. They even thought, or at any rate, they tried to persuade themselves they were doing a favour to God by continuing their old wicked practices. As the greater their sin was, the better the opportunity for the display of God's forgiving love. They sinned, so they said, that grace might abound. The church has been troubled and harassed by many a heresy in the course of the centuries. But the most damnable, the most soul-destroying that ever assailed it was the Anatonian heresy, which bade men to continue to sin because God was ready to forgive, which taught that sin was light, trivial, cheap, because pardon was free. Sin, light, sin, cheap, sin, trivial. My friends, look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Measure the enormity of the sin by the sacrifice of the cross. It cross, it cost God the life of his own dear son. And his son delivers us. You may remember this verse from a very famous hymn. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, for, for by every sin of ours we crucify the Lord afresh and put him to an open shame. The program of the Christian life is not sin and pardon, sin and pardon, sin and pardon, day after day, month after month, year after year. The program of the Christian life is pardon, sanctification and holiness. After pardon comes a daily struggle with sin until its power in our souls is broken and we come off more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not that I would imply that anyone on this side of the grave attains to a state of sinless perfection, or that the time will ever come on earth when the prayer, forgive us our sins, will be out of place on our lips. But the goal set before us is the perfect life, Towards the goal, we must daily press. And though on earth we may never attain it, yet today we ought to see it, see us nearer to it than yesterday. And tomorrow ought to find us nearer than today. There is something radically wrong with us if sin has a greater power over us today 
as it had, say, 10 years ago. Repentance is never genuine and sincere unless it creates within us the hatred and loathing of sin. We have never been truly forgiven if we can go on sinning the old sins day after day. For we never hear Christ say to to us, your sins are forgiven you, without hearing him add to this charge, from now on, sin no more. But the command is a hard one to obey. In a world so full of trial and temptation, so full of seductions and enticements to evil, how hard it is for poor, weak, frail men and women to obey this, the command, go sin no more. In a world that presses in upon us on every side, that spreads its glittering prizes before our eyes to tempt us. How hard it is to be unworldly, to hold the earth's best gifts cheap, while we set our affections on things above. In a world so full of uncleanness and impurity, how hard it is to keep one's garments clean and unspotted. Hard, did I say? No, utterly impossible. With the world as it is and man as he is, the task is impossible. To obey that command, we need help and strength. The task is too difficult for us. It's more than we can do in our own natural strength. So we cast the burden back upon our Lord and say to him, Master, we would fain obey you. We would fain live without sin, but we are weak and the world is strong, too strong for us. Lord, undertake for us. There it stands a prayer for the future, a cry to God that he will not suffer the world to overcome us and drag us down again to sin. Now, you'll notice that this prayer recognises the fact that the world is full of peril to the Christian because it is full of temptation. The word translated temptation in my text really means testing or trial. Never a day passes that something happens which puts our moral strength to the test. God does not tempt in the sense of inciting to evil. God tests. The presence of evil in our world, the incitements to evil that abound, looked out from God's standpoint, are tests. Tests of character, tests of moral strength. But these incitements to evil appeal to weaknesses and and evil in our own hearts. And so they ask, And they become temptations. And of such temptations, our world is full. John Bunyan, one of my favourite authors, described the Christian life as a journey. That is a journey through a very dangerous country. There are snares and pitfalls around us on every side. The path leads between a ditch on one side and a quagmire on the other. 
and along the route are the Slough of Despond and Bypath Meadow and Doubting Castle and Mount of Error, Broadway Gate and Dead Man's Lane and Vanity Fair. Yes, the path is one that is surrounded with peril. To stray from it is a very easy matter. The path is the path of life. And these pitfalls and snares and bypaths that endanger the unwary traveller on every hand are the temptations that beset a man's life and lure him to his ruin and death. The story of the fight between the English and the Scotch at the famous Battle of Bannockburn says that Bruce, on the night before the battle, honeycombed the ground in front of his army with pitfalls, each of which contained a hidden stake, and then covered them up again with green turf. In the morning, the English cavalry, when it charged upon the Scottish troops, found the ground which looked so firm and solid was deceitful and treacherous and falling into these hidden pitfalls, horse and rider came to their death. Does life to you look in prospect like a firm, safe, solid road? I tell you that every step you take, you need to beware of some secret pitfall. Does life appear in prospect in, in it to any of you like the still, glassy sea of a summer's noon? I tell you that beneath that shimmering, smiling surface lie hidden the dark and treacherous rocks which have meant wreck and death to many a voyager. Oh yes, the human life is beset with temptation. No one is exempt from it. No moments of the day is free from it. Incitements to sin abound. Invitations to enter the Broadway meet us at every turn. Why is it that parents are so anxious when their children are sent for the first time to fight life's battles for themselves in a large town. I will tell you, it's because they know the temptations abound. There is temptation in the glare and false gaiety of the public house. There's temptation in every painted, shameless face sitting upon our streets. There's temptation in the companionship of foolish and godless friends. There's temptation in the coarse and filthy speech of associates. There's temptation in unclean literature. There's temptation in business, in the home and at play. There is nowhere that temptation does not lurk. It penetrates everywhere. It found its way into paradise of old. And Adam yielded to its power. Who is free from it? Not one of us. Whenever man, wherever man is, their temptation is. There is no escape from it. Men try to avoid infection in case of an outbreak of disease by re removing themselves from the infected district. So men of old try to escape the assaults of temptation by leaving the busy world and fleeing into solitude. Those who know your church history know the Desert Fathers, for example. But it was all in vain. Temptation followed them to their retreats. 
Many were the fierce struggles and old saints like Saint Anthony had to wage in the secret of his cell. Oh, the world is full of temptation. Every lot has its own fierce tests of character. Business life has its temptations. Home life has its temptations. The life of hard, grinding toil has its temptations. The life of ease and leisure has its temptations also. Never a day passes but in some way or other an appeal to our lower, baser nature. We are urged to yield. The old Greek legends speak of the sirens, creatures half woman, half fish, who lived upon the rocks and who could sing the most ravishing songs, so entrancing by music that whoever heard it was irresistibly drawn to the singer. But it was woe to them, for the rocks where the sirens lived were strewn with the bones of dead men who had listened to their song and yielded to its fascination. That siren song is still being sung and every mariner on life's main highway hears it. The world, the flesh and the devil are the sirens of today. Who has not heard their song? Wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we hear its luring, tempting strains. God grant us, brethren, we may not yield, for yielding means destruction and death. This verse implies weakness of man. The Bible says, bring us not into temptation, into trial, into testing, because we are so prone to break down under trial. The fact that temptations abound would not matter very much if we were resilient against them. It's because we ourselves are so prone to yield that temptation is so terrible. To take a spark of green wood would, do, would not do very much harm. But to bring temptation upon us is like applying a flame to dry shavings or a match to gunpowder. The attack of temptation from without is made formidable by the weakness and treachery within. It's because we know our own weaknesses. It's because we know how liable we are to break down under any severe test that we pray, bring us not into temptation. I'm simply stating a matter of fact and observation when I say that there is in all of us a bias towards sin, an inclination towards evil. We walk lightly Sometimes we talk lightly sometimes of the old doctrine of original sin, but surely it expressed the truth that we dare not ignore. There is a bias in the human heart towards sin. It's easier for us to do wrong than it is to do right. That was the truth our Lord meant to convey. When he said the path of evil was a broad way, while the road to life was a narrow path. To do evil is easy. You have only to shout with the crowd and swim with the stream. But to do right is hard. You must swim against the current, 
You must dare to stand alone. And it's just this that gives temptation its power and makes it terrible. It accords with our own predispositions, the passions and desires of the, of the flesh support its efforts. The devil finds his best ally in the lusts and weaknesses of a man's own heart. There is no man or woman safe from temptation. There is no one who can boast that he is strong enough to resist every allurement. There is in all of us some weakness of the soul and temptation will assail us just at the weakest point. It will find the unfortified place and concentrate its attack upon it. It will find the joints in our harness and point the poison arrow there. The old Greek story says that Achilles, a great hero of the Trojan War, was dipped while he was yet a child in the waters of the Styx by his mother Thesis to make him invulnerable. And the results of that plunge were that every part of Achilles' body was proof against wounds with the exception of the heel by which his mother held him and which had not been submerged in the waters. For many years, as a result, Achilles escaped unhurt. But at last, the poison arrow of the Trojan, Trojan Paris found the weak spot and afflicted the death wound there. So, sin and temptation attack us where we are weakest. They appeal to our inclinations, our passions, our lusts. They found, they found out the weak spot. I can only discover one man in the whole of history was proof against this temptation. And that was the perfect man, Christ Jesus himself. But as for everyone else, the best, the bravest, the noblest have been surprised by some temptation, betrayed by some weakness, have fallen into sin. Do not say, friends, that this petition is a prayer for the weak. Do not say it's a prayer for the timid and the cowardly, as it is a prayer for all of us. Peter very likely thought that there were a number of needs for him to pray this prayer. Perhaps in his heart, he longed for an opportunity to be given to him of showing how strong and brave he was. Deny his Lord? No, not so. All the world forsook him, and no, though it meant death to be faithful, well, the night uh, did not pass without bringing an opportunity of putting his boasted strength to the test. But how badly Peter came out of the trial. Would you recognise the proud boaster of a few hours before in the swearing, blaspheming denier at cock crow? And we have many an example in the Bible besides that of Peter to warn us against overconfidence. Abraham, whose faith is commended in Scripture, lost all his faith in Egypt. 
Moses, the man who is renowned for his meekness, lost his temper with the children of, when the children of Israel murmured. David, the sweet singer of Israel, the man after God's own heart, was swept by his lust into an act of foulest wickedness. And these examples are enshrined in the pages of the scriptures to bid us beware of overconfidence and not to boast ourselves in our strength. Pride always comes before a fall. There's a weakness in all of us. To the strongest of you here today, to you who perhaps think yourselves beyond the reach of temptation, let me repeat the old Bible warning found in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 10. Here it is. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful you don't fall. It is the knowledge of our own weakness that makes temptation terrible. We distrust ourselves. We look back over past years and see the number of times we've fallen, the number of times we've given in to the fascination of the world's siren song. We remember, too, that when we did escape it, it was so as by fire. It was through pain and agony. Remember how hard the struggle was and how near we were to yielding. Let me ask you to notice this petition, that this petition illustrates the spirit of true Christian courage. It's not courage, but foolishness that courts danger. It's not courage that risks life and limb in an utterly stupid and needless task. It is folly. It's not courage that made that mad youth that I heard about climb the sheer rock face of the cliffs at Folkestone recently. It was mere senseless bravado. True courage will keep away from danger. True courage will only incur risk and peril when duty demands. Let us learn this lesson. It's not courage to venture into doubtful places. It's not courage to unite with questionable companions. It's not courage to peer into unclean books. It's not courage to appear to spend your evening in the public house. It's not courage to see how near you can go to the edge of the precipice without falling over. No, this is not courage unless you are prepared to say that it is courage that makes the silly moth flutter around a flame until at last it flutters into it. Courage? No. It is not courage. It's wicked, mad bravado. Your safety, my friends, against sin lives in being shocked by it. True courage looks at the provocations to evil with which life abounds and confesses I'm afraid of them. And then makes this petition its prayer. Father, bring us not into temptation. But it may be that in spite of our fears and in spite of our prayers, God may see fit to bring us into temptation, into some fierce trial that shall test our moral strength. God, we read in Genesis, God did tempt, did tempt Abraham. He put Abraham's faith and obedience to a searching trial. Jesus, we read, was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness 
to undergo those 40 days of fierce testing. We shrink from these fierce trials, but they are good for us, for if resisted, they will develop strength in our souls. We are better for temptation, resisted and overcome, than we should have been if we had never been tempted at all. It is in conflict with temptation that God's Victoria Cross, the cross for valour, is to be won. Let us remember this. There is nothing sinful in being tempted. We only sin when we yield to temptation. Well, supposing that God does see fit to let us enter into temptation, to let our strength and courage be tested by fierce, grim, deadly conflict with sin and evil. What shall we pray for? Will we pray then, deliver us from the evil one? We will pray to him to help us that we may not put sin against him by yielding. We'll ask him to clothe us with a whole armour of God and to put in our hand our hands the sword of the spirit and so enable us to withstand the assaults of the evil one and having done all things to stand there shall be on our part no foolish rushing into temptation no remembering our own weakness we will pray father lead us not into it But if temptation comes upon us when we are in the path of duty, then we can look up to him, claim his presence with us in a battle and say, deliver us from the evil one. We say, let us not be overcome in the struggle. Let us not be beaten in the fight. Suffer us not to fall away from you. Deliver us by your mercy. Deliver us, good Lord, and God will deliver us. I say nothing about the man who rushes in temptation of his own free will, but of the man upon whom temptation comes when he is in the line of duty. I'm bold to say, God will deliver you. His promises are here. In this book, you find these wonderful words. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And in Peter 2 and verse 2, verse 9, we read, If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the uprighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Christian, in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, had a fierce, long, stubborn fight with Apollon, but he won the victory at last and was able to shout exultantly the words from Romans 8, 37, Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So let God be with us and help us overcome temptation. So our final hymn is 'Fight the Good Fight, one, four, three. And uh, during the communion, John, we have um, Break Thou the Bread of Life, the first two verses at the start and two at the end. <laughs>